It's great to see everyone here this morning. We want to say welcome to our visitors. We're glad that you are here. As we have been announcing in the past, we have a new website, RoyCityCOC.org. You want to go to that website and see a, a lot of good study material, especially if you click on to the links page. You will find all kinds of study material that I think will be very uh, profitable uh, to you as you uh, diligently study the Word of God. When you come to Exodus chapter 3, Moses is 80 years old. He has been in the wilderness for about 40 years. When you read chapter 1 of Exodus, you find out about the circumstances around his birth. How that he was taken into Pharaoh's household. Moses could have been perhaps a high official within the Egyptian empire. Moses probably could have been next in line to be Pharaoh within the Egyptian hierarchy. But he realized the affliction of his people. He identified with the Hebrew people because he was Hebrew. He saw them being mistreated in chapter 2 and he killed a man buried his body in the sand. And he was driven from, from Egypt when he found out Pharaoh sought to kill him. So in 40 years, he spent tending his father-in-law Jethro's flocks. He was no longer a part of the royal empire of Egypt, which was the most powerful empire of its day. He didn't have all the luxuries of royalty, the palace, the food, the uh, servant serving him, he's now out with the sheep and with the goats and with the animals tending the herds of Jethro, his father-in-law. Forty years he's involved in that activity. But God had a purpose for him. And this Sunday morning, the next Sunday morning, we're going to study the call of Moses. How that God called him to fulfill a great purpose. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Jethro was a priest, but of course this was before the Levitical priesthood. He was a priest perhaps like Melchizedek was a priest, as we read in the book of Genesis. A priest of the one true God. There was a type of priesthood at that time. Those who were loyal to the one true God, who did not worship the idols of the day, but they were a priest of the one true God. Jethro was most likely one of those priests. And he was tending to those flocks. And it says in verse 1, And he led the flock to the back of the desert, and came to Horeb. This is also known as Mount Sinai. The mountain of God. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flaming fire, from the midst of a bush. So he looked and beheld the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now, Moses being a shepherd of the flocks that, that were owned by Jethro, he saw bushes burn before. He saw burning brush before. Of course, you'd be out there in the wilderness, you would see uh, things like that burning, perhaps from lightning strikes and things like that. That wasn't unusual in and of itself. What was unusual about it, this bush was burning, but it was not burning up. It was burning, but it was not being consumed. And Moses saw that and knew that that's something different. That's something extraordinary. It is said that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire. Oftentimes, fire is describing God's presence in the Bible. And God was manifesting himself through this angel of the Lord. Verse 3, Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So he's going to go see, why is this bush burning, but it's not burning up. Verse 4, So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He said, Here I am. Verse 5, Then he said to him, Do not draw near this place. 
Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. This manifestation of God is what's known as a theophany. God has manifested Himself visibly and audibly in the world. God is invisible to us. But He manifested Himself from time to time, visibly and audibly, to call someone or to express His purpose. He's calling Moses. And He says to Moses, calling to him, and He says, Here I am. Moses responds, Here I am. He says, Where you are is holy ground. Take the sandals off your feet. Verse 6, Moreover He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So here you have Moses recognizing that he is in the presence of the God of his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knew that he was in the midst of holiness. He knew that he was in the midst of power. And so he had this reverence attitude towards God. He would not look upon the burning bush. Verse 7, The Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God says, I am aware of what's going on in Egypt. Remember, they were going through this affliction for hundreds of years. There arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Remember in the latter part of the book of Genesis, Joseph rose to a prominent position in Egypt. And his family, the family of Jacob, came down. And they were sheltered and taken care of by the Egyptians because of Joseph. But a Pharaoh came to power that did not recognize that special relationship the Hebrews had with the Egyptians and so oppressed them, in fact, enslaved them. And God says, I see what's going on. I recognize the affliction that's going on. Verse 8, So I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. That's exactly what he promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That promise that was first made to Abraham that He was going to give him that land, but it would not be to him personally. It would be to his descendants. Now the descendants have grown into a mighty people. And they are enslaved by the Egyptians. And God says, I'm going to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. I see what's going on. I understand their affliction. The cries are going up for deliverance and probably went up for a very long time ever since the oppression began, ever since the slavery began. And just because we cry unto God and we don't see immediate deliverance doesn't mean God's not listening. This is according to God's timetable. This is according to God's will. But He says, Now I'm going to deliver them. That must have seemed like good news to Moses. He must have thought, well, great, they are going to be delivered. God is going to deliver them and bring them out and fulfill the promises that He made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then you come to verse 10. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. That may not have sounded too good to Moses at that time. Remember, it's been 40 years since Moses left Egypt. He's not a part of the Egyptian people anymore. He's an outcast. He's out herding sheep. He's 80 years old. He's in good health. He'll live to be 120, we're told. But he's in good health for an 80-year-old. But still, he's an older man. And and God is saying, I'm going to deliver those people, Moses, and I want you to go do it. Now, God could have delivered the people any way He so chose. God's all-powerful. He could have chose any means to deliver them. 
He could have raised up any person within Goshen, within the Hebrew people, to deliver them. But he chose Moses to do that. That was a shock to Moses. Verse 11, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? That was a question depicting his inferiority complex. Who am I? Why are you choosing me? And so oftentimes people think, who am I that I can be a Christian and live the Christian life? You see, Moses had a past. He killed a man. Even though that was 40 years in his past, it still was something that was bearing on his mind, most likely. That's the reason why he's tending to Jethro's flock. And so because of that past that he had, because of the things he'd done in his past, he's saying, in essence, I'm not worthy to do this. Why are you calling me to do this? He had a sense of inferiority. And that is why he's asking the question. To oftentimes Christians, they, they refuse to, to do the things that God wills them to do found in the New Testament because, don't you know what I've done, Lord? Don't you know my past? Of course he does. But if you've been forgiven and you've been cleansed and you're a new person in Christ, what does that matter? God can use anyone that will let them self submit to the will of God. And Moses is going to, going to give a series of excuses. We're not going to have time to get into all of them because it's going to go into chapter 4. We're just going to look at chapter 3 this morning. But he's going to raise a series of objections to him being the leader, the deliverer, out of this uh, situation, out of this bondage. And we probably would not have this recorded if Moses would have just accepted the assignment and said, yes, Lord, I will do your will. But it's... It has been said in the past, every great leader has been reluctant to lead. Because they understand the enormity of their task. They understand the seriousness of it. And so here you have Moses, someone who killed a man so long ago, an outcast being called to deliver this great nation of people. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He is feeling his inferiority. Verse 12, So God said to him, I certainly will be with you. You see, God doesn't ask us to do something we can't do and something that we have to do by ourselves. I will be with you. Moses, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. You're going to bring them to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, and you're going to serve me there. You know, Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And Moses had to understand and get it through his head. He's not going alone. God is calling him and will equip him to do the work that God has called him to do. So he, he raised the objection, number one, who am I? Inferiority. Verse 13. Here's objection number two. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Objection number two, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. How many times people have been asked to teach a class or to, to do some evangelistic work, perhaps trying to reach their their neighbors or their relatives with the gospel message and they don't do it because they say, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. 
And the cure for that is Acts 17.11. Search the Scriptures daily. You search the Scriptures daily, you commit yourself to do that, then you will know enough. You will know enough to be able to teach someone else. And so, so Moses is asking this question, what name shall I give to them? I don't know enough. If they ask me, the God of her father sent me, what, what is your name? And I just don't know enough to, to approach them and to accomplish this task. Why would he say that? If they were the chosen people of God, would they not know who God is? The, the solution to that question is in Ezekiel chapter 20. Here's the reason why God needed to be identified among his own people. God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel, talking to the elders of Israel, takes their minds back to them being delivered from Egyptian bondage. And here's the reason why they, that God needed to be, be identified. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 4. Will you pass judgment against me? Will you pass judgment, son of man? Explain to them the abomination of their fathers. Talking about their ancestors. Verse 5. Say to them, This is what the Lord God said. On the day that I chose Israel, I swore an oath to the descendants of Jacob's house and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. That's exactly what God is about to tell Moses in the burning bush. On that day I swore to them that I would bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land I searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, a most beautiful of all lands. Verse 7, I also said to them, Each of you must throw away the detestable things that are before your eyes and not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Look at verse 8. But they rebelled against me and were unwilling to listen to me. None of them threw away the detestable things that were before their eyes, and they did not forsake the idols of Egypt. The Hebrew people in Egyptian slavery became idolatrous. And they started worshiping the idols of their masters. So I considered pouring out my wrath on them. Ezekiel 20 and verse 8. I considered to pour out my wrath on them, exhausting my anger against them within the land of Egypt. Verse 9, but I acted for the sake of my name so that it would not be profane in the eyes of the nations they were living among, in whose sight I had made myself known to Israel by bringing them out of Egypt. They had become like the people around them. They started worshiping idols. You know, it's no coincidence that the Egyptians worshiped golden calves and Aaron, under pressure, made a golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai because of the Egyptians. And it took a long time for them to get that thinking out of their head. And so, as, as Moses is asking, who, who are you? What name shall I give to them? Back to Exodus uh, chapter 3, verse 14, God said to him, I am who I am. He said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That expression, I am who I am means He's the eternal existing One. Never had a beginning and never will have an end. The Almighty. You see, the Egyptian gods, they would get married. The Egyptian gods would have children. The Egyptian gods would fight one another. And the Egyptian gods would die. Because the people who made them, made them in their own image. And what do people do? People get married. People have children. People fight and people die. But the one true God never had a beginning never had an end. He is the I Am, the ever-present, self-existing One. Verse 14, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I Am has sent me to you. Verse 15, Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord, and notice on the board there, Lord, all capital letters, is the Hebrew name Yahweh. And I am who I am is basically the root meaning of Yahweh. Yahweh, the God of, our fa of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial, memorial to all generations. 
This is what you tell them. I am that I am has sent me. My name is Yahweh. In our English, the word the Lord, that's not a name. The Hebrew word there is Yahweh, depicting the name of God. Verse 16, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, or Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. I understand your affliction. I know what you're going through. Verse 17, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of the Egyptians to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. This is how you identify me to them. I'm not one of your Egyptian deities. I'm not Osiris. I'm not Ra. I am Yahweh. The one true living God. And tell them about the promise, and some of them will know this, this promise of being delivered to a land flowing with milk and honey. That's the promise that God made to Abraham. Remind them of that promise. And God will deliver them. Verse 18. Then they will heed your voice, and you should uh, shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, to Yahweh our God. Let us go, that we might sacrifice on Mount Horeb. He says in verse 19, but I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. He's going to be stubborn. He's going to resist my will. And because of that, verse 20, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. First you go and make the request. He's going to resist you. I'm going to identify myself by ten plagues. Then after that, he'll let you go. Some people have to learn the hard way who God is. And Pharaoh was going to be one of them. Verse 21, And I will give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. They're slaves right now and they're oppressed. But when I get through with them, the Egyptians will find favor, will show favor towards the Egyptians, or to the Hebrew. And it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. Verse 22, But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and of clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians." They're slaves now being oppressed by the Egyptians. And God is saying, when I get through with them, you're going to plunder the Egyptians. I will deliver you out of their hands. But we've looked at two objections that Moses has raised. First, who am I that I should go? And secondly, I don't know enough. Who are you that I might identify you to the children of Israel? to the Hebrews. And so God answered both of those objections. I will be with you. And here's the information that you need. You learn this information and you tell that to the children of Israel. We're not finished with the objections, but we will look at that next week. You see, God has called us as well. He's called us through the gospel. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you're willing to respond favorably, if you're willing to respond to His will and obey the gospel, you can be saved. Believing in Christ, confessing Him as the Son of God, repenting of your past, being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you're a new person, and God can use you to His glory if you'll let Him. If you've done that and you've gone back into the world, repent. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.